Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. Hi, this is Craig. Just want to let you know you can now advertise here on Everyone Loves Guitar podcast. For more information, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber with Everyone Loves Guitar, and we're with one of the most popular and most well-recorded session players like in the history of music, actually. Uh, we're with Carl Verheyen. He is out of L.A. He's uh, been doing this for 50-plus years, even though he looks like he's about 35, but I don't know. I, I try to get that out of him. He wouldn't let me know. He's had a successful career in loads of different areas of music. He's a critically praised musician, vocalist, songwriter, arranger, producer, and educator with 13 CD is that right i think so 13 or 14 yeah it's and, up there and two live dvds released worldwide he's been an la first call session player for the last 30 years and he's literally played on hundreds and hundreds of records soundtracks and television shows so let me tell you that the short bio i'm gonna read now i mean we would need literally an entire hour just to read his like complete resume um, he's also been a member of British rock group Super Tramp since 1985, and he's played in front of millions of fans and sold out arenas worldwide. In addition, he's the creative force behind the Carl Verheyen band, and they just came in from uh, Europe. He's also heavily featured in the film documentary about the electric guitar called Turn It Up. On the educational front, Carl's produced two instructional videos and several educational books. He's written for multiple guitar magazines, and he's taught private guitar lessons to John Fogarty, members of System of a Down, and Maroon 5, and he's conducted master classes all over the world. He's also got a really cool um, online platform called CV Academy, and we'll talk about that. He's got two handmade signature guitars, not one, but two, with LSL Guitar Company that are patterned after his own vintage strats. And he's helped design a unique double cutaway acoustic guitar with Avalon. Again, this is like completely, completely abbreviated. He's played on records by Albert Lee, Robin Ford, Robin Thicke, Bonamassa, Scott Henderson, B.B. King, Glenn Fry, John Fogarty, Steve Morse, Stanley Clark, Belinda Carlisle, Dave Grusin, Melissa Manchester, Jose Feliciano, and literally hundreds of others. Um, he's also, I'm like pausing because I can't even believe I'm saying that and uh, like wow uh he's also provided the music and scoring on over 60 motion pictures tv shows movies and cartoons and man in your spare time what do you do <laughs> i like to practice <laughs> he likes to practice thank you so much <laughs> carl thanks a bunch for coming on the show man i know you're a super busy dude thank you man um You've got two signature guitars at LSL, and I looked at some of the videos. They're really great-looking guitars. Um, I was curious how you got involved with LSL and what was that process like? And also, as far as features and benefits, what makes this uniquely you? Like, where's your stamp on these? Well, the, the, the whole thing started when Fender called me up and said, hey, we see that you play this 1961 Seafoam Green Strat all over the world. It's in hundreds and hundreds of YouTube videos. We would like to fly you to Flagstaff, Arizona, and uh, des and and do a, an exact replica of that guitar and and put it out there, you know, as a, as a as a model. So you know the Carl Verheyen Fender Strat. So I flew over. They flew me over to Flagstaff, I guess is where it is, uh, or no Scottsdale. Scottsdale is where their their corporate offices were. I met with the guys. We had a nice long day, and at the end of the day, they said, "Well, basically, all we really want to do." is get get your seafoam green 61 strat and make an exact replica of it uh make 40 copies of them and sell them for six thousand dollars a piece yeah. and i said I, I don't really want that what i want is an 18 to 2400 dollar guitar that has all the things that i like in the very best of strats and make that available to the working musician and they said well you'll have to talk to the people in corona california so I called there the next morning when I flew back, and they said, eh, this is strictly a steel-toed boot and hard hat facility. You need to talk to the people in Scottsdale. And I said, well, I was in Scottsdale yesterday. So it was that kind of a right hand doesn't know what the left is doing. 
So at that point, LSL called me up and they were making these unbelievably great Telecaster copies that um, the guy, Lance Lerman, who's um, uh, the president of the company, he has a, um, a background in designing speaker cabinets. And he even did it in China for a while. And he was making cabinets for Sirwin Vega and JBL and all that stuff. And he, he made a couple of tellies and people went wild for him. So he says, I want to get into the Stratocasters and, uh, and you know, that, that model, uh, he goes, um, you know, would you be interested? And I said, yeah. So I started telling him, I got 13 strats and the light, the lighter ones are the ones I gravitate to. First of all, weight. And my 58 strat is like 7.3 pounds. And Holy it's- crap. That's really. Yeah. So I wow, said, if you're going nice to make, nice. make a CV special, as we call it, or the CV model, you got to keep save the, the lightest wood for me. So he did. Then I told him the pickups in the 61 strat rock the most, but I really like the neck pickup in the 50 in the 65 strat. So we kind of got all those things correct. And then I do this thing where I float the bridge. And there's a few YouTube videos out there of, you know, Carl Verheyen's tremolo setup or, you know, strat bridge setup. My G string, when you pull up on the bar, goes up a minor third. My B string goes up a whole step to C sharp. And my E string goes up to F. So we wanted to, we wanted to incorporate that, the right gauges. Let's see, what else do I do? I put a tone, one of the, the back tone knob is on the, uh, the, the bridge pickup. And that's about it. Weight, setup. Um, pickup output and um, and the tone knob and volume con- configuration. That's about what all it is. But what I did is I took the best of all the the vintage strats and even some of the newer ones. And uh, right now they're making me a maple neck model, which will be ready this next week before I fly over to Seattle to play. So. That's really cool, man! Congratulations on that. I, you look. You. It's funny when you saw the videos, you like looked really like kind of, pr- you know, not in an obnoxious way, but really happy and proud and satisfied is probably the best word with what. Yeah. You know, p- these guitars are affordable. They're, they're uh, maybe 2,400, 2,600, something mm. like that. I think you can even get them from Sweetwater and uh, they're, they're, they're great because, uh, you know, eventually you want to stop taking vintage guitars on the road unless you've got a serious crew that can guard them with their lives yeah. and stuff. That's great, man. Well, congratulations on that. And um, so, where could people could buy them at any normal or not wrong, normal ordinary retailer? Yeah, online and offline. Quite a few stores all around the country. So, that's great, good. man. That's a, that, thanks for sharing that. That was interesting. You know, it's funny. You talk about taking guitars on the road. I have, you know, Ricky Medlock. Uh, I know the name, but I don't know him personally. He is the guy. He founded Blackfoot. And then he's been, he was with Leonard Skinner and he still is with Skinner. Um, and he wrote a uh, highway song, that real popular song when we were kids. Oh, yeah. And uh, he apparently, I have him coming on the show next week. I'm going to talk about it, but he travels and plays his like 59 flying V. Wow. <laughs> I know, I but he, the tuning pegs haven't snapped off, you know, that crumbled. I don't That's know, crazy. but he's like a larger than life character. So, like in the back of my mind, I think people just know if you ever stole this, like it's going to be a lot worse for you than Ricky. It's yeah. just, he's like a very, so I'm going to ask him about that. But yeah, that's a great thing. Cause I have a lot of guys I talk to, obviously they have beautiful guitars and they can't bring them on the road for that reason. Yeah, But, but I also, I also look at those old guitars of mine, you know, the, I just want to be making records with those with, for the rest of my life. And if a neck breaks or a headstock snaps off of the Gibson, that's, that'd be real sad. So yeah. I, I, Keeping those for the studio and for my own pro- pro- projects and uh, practice and enjoyment. You know? Yeah, so. totally get it, man. So your career is really diverse, probably more than anybody I've interviewed. And in. I've had 350 guests on here. Wow. And I, I was curious, what did you first start doing professionally? And how did you move from doing that into session work and then you know movies and, and so on? That's a good question. I mean... I started playing when I was 11. On my 11th birthday, I got a guitar and a lesson and then, you know, played in a few little bands and stuff. But I think the first real, uh, you know, we're, we're talking backyard kegger parties and stuff. Sure. But the first, the first real good gig I got, um, I think I was 17 years old and my parents were walking through this restaurant in Pasadena where I grew up. And I heard a guy singing and playing in the bar. And I went, you know, I can do that. So uh, I asked somebody to talk to the manager, and I came back the next day and auditioned for him. And he gave me a gig 
but he said, you are 18, aren't you? And I said, no. He goes, well, you can't have, you can't work in a bar till you're 18. So, uh, I, I, he said, call me when you turn 18. So three months later I turned 18, called him and he goes, okay, you're hired. So I started working Sundays and Mondays at this little place called the sawmill singing and playing acoustic guitar, like Van Morrison tunes and, uh, Joni Mitchell tunes and Jackson Brown and all that kind of stuff. So, um, that, that kind of went on for a while. And then I, added some guys to it. We moved to a different place. And then due to a chance meeting with this jazz guy uh, who came into the bar and said, I like the way you play. You want to get together sometime. He was an older dude. Uh, uh, Not Larry Kuntz, but Dave Kuntz was his name, a jazz guy out of Pasadena. So I got together with him and he, he just turned me on to the world of jazz by uh, showing me. (laughs) It was like, we, he pulls out some music, and there was a. The first chord was F major seventh, which I knew, but the second chord was D minor seventh flat five, which I didn't know. So I said, "Well, here's a D minor. Let's see, D E F G A. A is the fifth. If I put that to A flat, is that it?" And then he goes, "Yeah, that's it." But then he proceeded to show me like 25 voicings for D minor seventh, <laughs> and it's like looking over this plateau at a, a a field of knowledge I had no clue about. So I decided to kind of jump out of this bar scene and, and go to Berkeley College of Music for a semester. I just went one semester and um, practiced real hard. And then I I got back to L.A. and moved in with some jazz guys down in Orange County. This is in my early 20s and just practiced like crazy, did little jazz gigs. And then one day, so, so I got a call from... Uh, I think it was the Orange County Musicians Union saying, do you play, uh, do you have a wah-wah pedal? <laughs> and I go, yeah. And they said, we need somebody to play with Frankie Avalon and That's Annette funny. Picello at uh, Knott's Berry Farm, which is kind of like a Disneyland place. Yeah, yeah. So I did it. You know, I had to join the Musicians Union and, and do, you know, five, six shows a week for, I don't know, a month or two. And so now I'm now I'm, you know, in the union and a professional musician. And and that's kind of where it started. But I realized that living in Orange County was the small fishbowl, you know, and I'd rather be a small fish in a big bowl than a big fish. So I moved up to uh, I moved north up to L.A., which is only an hour and a half north, you know, uh, and kind of jumped into it. And at that point, I realized all the heavy cats in L.A., are the studio guys, you know, they're not, they're not necessarily the jazz dudes like you find in New York, you know, they're, they're more the, the studio guys and, and quite a few of them are, are, are rock guys, you know? Um, so I remember just beginning to break in and, and, um, there was a band I played in called Richard Elliott's band. He's, he's a, at the time he was an R and B sax player. He joined tower of power for a few years. Uh, he kind of moved into the smooth jazz world many years later, but at that time he was kind of R and B and it was hard hitting fusion stuff. So I joined his band and we played at a local club and um, a few composers came in and saw me playing and said, I want you to play on my, on my TV shows or whatever. So I think some of the early sessions I was doing was like happy days and Laverne and Shirley. That is so <laughs> Sit- cool. Sitcoms for Paramount, you know, playing that kind of, rockabilly happy day stuff and then that guy would get bigger gigs and then he'd orchestrate for somebody else and then uh and you, you know, kept it, getting the calls from these guys as yeah. they as they moved up you moved up yeah. and you'd start networking a bit and then this composer says well who do you use well i use carl Verheyen. well i give him a try and then i remember uh one day i was at home and i get a call and somebody says do you play the charango and i said uh yeah. How many strings does it have? <laughs> eight. He That's said, a good eight qualifier. Like, yeah. I, yeah. I play that. You got one? And he goes, yeah. So I came over and played on this movie <laughs> called Stand and Deliver. And uh, it was probably in the. Yeah, why do I know? That was a popular movie, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It was a big movie car starring James Almost, whatever, whatever that guy. Oh, Ed, Ed, Edward James Almost. Yes. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, right. So I played the Chirango. And while I was there, I said, you know what? That'd be cool. Just threw it out there, you know. I said, "What would be cool is uh, some Santana style electric guitar in this in this scene here because it's kind of high energy." And he goes, "Did you bring one?" And I go, "Yeah," because I didn't I didn't do cartage. I just went over to his house, right? Mm. 
And I said, yeah, I actually have an SG in the car, and that's what Santana plays. I must have thought ahead, you know, uh, Chirango, Latin flavor, yeah. maybe I'll just throw this in with a little Princeton amp. So I did, and the guy said to me, um, man, I really like your playing, and I'm starting a TV show next week called Cheers. Holy crap. And will you play on the theme, and will you play on it for, you know, and if, if, if you know, the pilot, and then... So I played on the pilot, and then the show got picked up for like eight or nine years, and I did all those too for this guy. And then you know now you're working for that contractor at Paramount. His name is Carl Fortina. He likes me. He says, "Hey, there's this other show coming up, you know, Seinfeld or whatever. Would you do that?" Or and so the ball just starts rolling, and pretty soon you're knee deep in the studio world, uh, which in many ways I consider to be a gigantic career detour. Because all I really wanted to do was play play my own music and write my own songs and sure. be out on the road touring with my band. You know, so that's amazing. Did um wow, that is so cool. Was there any one person, and maybe it was the guy who brought you on to Cheers that that one guy, you know, the like if you made a map of all the the branches, was there anybody that comes to mind like that guy or gal was the nucleus and like tons of branches came off there that you couldn't even imagine? There, there's an orchestrator in town named Tim Simonek, and he's a dear friend. And he seemed to be the orchestrator for the hottest composer in town at the time. So he was orchestrating for Graham Ravel when Graham was just getting movie after movie after movie, big, huge movies. He was orchestrating for Michael Giacchino when Michael Giacchino was doing all that amazing Pixar stuff like uh, Cars and Ratatouille and Up and, uh, man, uh, The Incredibles 1 and 2. You know, this guy just gets all that great work. And um, and so, but, but my buddy Tim was the orchestrator, right? And, and he would have a say in, hey, this would be a great car, a great part for Carl Verheyen because he does this sort of ethereal man thing that'll work with the strings, you know, and he'll weasel me in there. And uh, so he, he was really good. The other thing that happened was there was this woman who would come and see me play at a club and she, nobody paid much attention to her, you know? Uh, but, uh, I, I befriended her somehow. And she says, you know, I'm secretary to the head of music at Paramount Pictures. The head of music was a guy named Jack Hunsaker. And she goes, if you give me some cassettes, this is cassette era, of, you know, st samples of your stuff. Every composer has to walk by my desk. I'll pass them out. Holy crap. Oh, what, a, what an opportunity. So I did that. Did you marry her after that? Oh. <laughs> I should have. I should have. <laughs> and, uh, she kind of disappeared off the scene. I don't know what happened to her. But, but she passed out cassettes. And I don't know, um, you know, how many people just put in the trash can. But I did get a couple of calls from people from that, you know, which was – Pretty amazing. I don't know if that stuff still happens. But wow. It was a great, great opportunity. So everything was very organic. You know, it seems very organic and very natural, the growth of this thing and how one thing led to another and very smooth. It didn't seem like you were like, uh, when I say killing yourself, you weren't killing yourself to get new business. You were just doing what you do and things came naturally. Yeah. Yeah. And then I got really busy and, uh, uh, you know, to eight to 10 sessions a week, a lot of them jingles, which are shorter calls but you could do a you could do a tv show in the morning from like uh nine to noon and then you could do a, a one o'clock jingle and then do a movie date in the afternoon or do a record date that night and uh you know it becomes it becomes kind of nine to five after a while you know yeah. and but the beautiful thing is it's different guys every day you know yeah you're, all your eggs are not in one basket man that right. is like, see, really see cool see a different drummer and you ask him how's your family and then the, the afternoon sessions you had another drummer and you know and, uh, and so that part of it was really cool you know and then the the session scene really tapered off after the i would say in the early 2000s there was that dot com yeah bus, you know there was the boom, and then it kind of yeah. And that was like ninety eight, I think, right? And ninety eight yeah. is where it first. I was still burning through about two thousand one, and then mm. two thousand two, Super Tramp had a massive, you know, six month tour or something, and that's also a, a, a groove killer for for the session scene because they start hiring other guys, and they get used to those guys, oh. or those guys play on the demo, and then when the real thing comes around, they have to call that guy you know? for the master now. Yeah, but but that doesn't bother me because. At some point, I woke up one day and just realized it is much more soul satisfying 
to be playing in a club in, uh, I don't know, Boise, Idaho, and seeing the, the whole front row singing along to a song I wrote in my kitchen back in the late 80s. You know, then then having headphones on, reading reading the music to uh, M11, which means music, real one, song, or Q1, you know. Sure. Uh, you know, that's how they title the movie sk- theme songs and the, 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 the cues that go in a TV show, M M23, you know. And, and, you know, when you're doing that every day, you're kind of just spitting it out. And, yeah. Uh, uh, I put myself into it, my passion into it, but... It's a different career because if you think about uh, what it takes to be a professional musician, if you're an artist, the artist in you is saying, this is how I want a D7 chord to sound. This is what I, how I want to voice it. And this is the line I want to play over it uh, melodically. If you're uh, a sideman, you're... You're basically your job is to bring to fruition the composer or the artist's uh, musical vision, and many cases you're even what I call the well listened craftsman, yeah. which is which is a bit like a plumber. You know, a plumber goes in and goes, "Yeah, there's a problem under the sink. I have to go out to the truck and get a, uh, a quarter inch and a street L and a <laughs> whatever or an electrician." Yeah, yeah. With me, I go. Oh, you want me to sound like ZZ Top? Okay, I need to go out to the my go to my trunk and pull out a Les Paul and a Fender Champ amp, and you know, have the Texas Shuffle, which is different than the Chicago Shuffle, and yeah. you know, Billy Gibbons plays the pinch harmonics, and you know, you try to pull off that, which is really fun. And if you're a real fan of music like I am, you know, it's 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 satisfying in itself. But nothing as much as the as the solo artist career. You know? Yeah, I could totally get that. Are you good about like? Because I know it's tough for me. Um, it it I'm I'm better at it as I'm older. But when there's so much opportunity, and and like you know you that's what you wanted, mm-hmm. and then when you're there, it's like, holy shit! There's a lot of. You know, like you could pretty much work 24-7 in a sense. Were you pretty good about like backing off and saying, man, I need to have a life? Or did you push it, push it, and then like get burned out? Or like what was your mindset with all that stuff? I don't recall ever really getting burnt out. Um, but I didn't back off too much. <laughs> yeah, so you – yeah. It was, I was going for it. And then, you know, it, it naturally tapers off. There's a great joke that I'll put myself as the punchline. It's – uh. Who is Carl Verheyen? Uh, Get me Carl Verheyen. Get me somebody who sounds like Carl. Get me a young Carl Verheyen. Who is Carl Verheyen, right? So the arc of of a a sideman's career is that. So there's a natural thing to bring up. And when you look at people like Larry Carlton, who was doing thousands of sessions and, and then moved into a solo career, or even Steve Lukath or even Robin Ford, some of these guys who became solo artists following quite a big sideman career yeah you know, you, you know it, it's sort of a natural progression i tried to speed it up a little bit because i really enjoyed getting out and playing yeah. you know people as opposed to sitting in a studio every day that's funny i interviewed robin and he said that he should have gotten off the road 10 years ago he said it's really you know beat the the piss out of him you know he's tired you know yeah i could tell you know i talked to him a lot too and he seems pretty burnt out on it, and uh, and also he, I think, I think with in the case of him, and he's an old friend. We've known each other since the seventies. I think that he didn't ever get the respect that was due to him, and and feels that way. Yeah, for sure. He's seen guys that are not as good and, and just rise up much faster and uh, take over, whereas uh, you know he's got the talent. So yeah. anyway, yeah, for sure. Um. I don't know if you can answer this, but imagine that you could. Uh, tell me the three most interesting sessions that you've ever been on. Let me get the word "ever" out there because that's too like daunting. Three most three tell me some of the three interesting sessions you've been on, and if you could also tell me how you got the gig and what made the session cool or interesting. Uh, I'll tell you a, a horrifying session. I, I showed up at Universal uh, Studios, which is no longer there uh, you know it's it's well 
the, the, the story is that the composer, his name was David McHugh, and he said, hey, I got a kind of a difficult cue. Do you mind checking it out in advance? And I believe this was even before fax machines. So they sent a messenger over, piece of music. I opened it up. I looked at it. It was in 6-8 time, key of A major, three sharps. I read it down. I went, this is not hard. You know? And then I read it down an octave higher and lower. And then I said, maybe I'll harmonize it in thirds or sixths. You know, figure he wants something more than just this because this is not difficult. So the next morning I show up there. And I'll never forget, um, Jeff Percaro was on drums, Abraham Laboreal on bass. Oh, my God. Just a great, great <laughs> What a crew. Band, but about six, 60 string players, right? So they go, okay, Carl, we're going to start with that one we sent to you. So they said, you know, M34. So I go, M34, that doesn't sound familiar. Sure enough, I pull up this horrifying black page of all chordal stuff. And before I could say, uh, excuse me, this isn't what you sent me. I'm going to need a little time with this. They start counting it off. And I get to about bar three, you know, and I'm taking my pencil out and go, okay, this is nothing more than a D ninth over A. I can play it on the fifth fret. Okay, this is nothing for the, more than a B flat diminished with an F sharp in it. I can play this here. I'm writing stuff. Okay, okay, I'm ready. And then we get to about bar five and I have to stop. You know, I just keep folding. <laughs> and the string players don't enter until bar 19. So this goes on for like a half an hour. And I keep saying, I have never seen this music. He doesn't care. He's just moving ahead. And I'm kind of way in the back of a big uh, orchestral thing. And I had actually brought a student with me that day to sit in the chair next to me and and watch the proceedings. And I'm sweating and, and Abe, Abe's looking over at me and, you know, going, boy, I'm glad I'm not in your chair. Anyway, this goes on until I get to about bar 16 or so. And then you see all those violin bows go up uh, as they get ready to play. And then I fold in bar 17 or 18 and they go, you can hear them grumble. Took the whole 45 minutes before I got to their entrance. And then I think the music repeated. So I was okay. But God, I've never been more terrified wow. in my life. And when I went up to the podium on the break to, to mention it to the composer, he basically turned on his heels and walked away. I go, oh, boy. It's the last time I'll ever work for him. But I ended up working for him again and eventually told him what happened. That they, they messengered the wrong piece of music. I, I know I know 1M6 really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. And then I remember one time at Capitol uh, – I was doing a um, a Drew Barrymore movie date, and uh, they said, we need you to sound like Jeff Beck at the Royal Philharmonic. <laughs> so, I, so I pulled out a 58. Nothing song. demanding, right? <laughs> no. You know, and I had to play a really high melody. You know, I think it was in the key of B-flat minor, so it's the 18th fret on the guitar. You know, I had to play this real high melody. But the buzz from my old Strat was pretty much louder than the string section. So... <laughs> I had to, uh, I pulled out a Les Paul. They said, no, that doesn't sound like Jeff Beck. So I ended up pulling out this little Tex-Mex $300 Strat that I had that had some, uh, I think they were Seymour Duncan noiseless pickups in it. And that's how I got it. That's how you but got I remember having to play three or four different guitars. And uh, let me think. Um, what, what a great lesson, though, because everybody's so like gear obsessed. Yeah, and I here know. you 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 did this with a three hundred dollars strat with a Mexican strat. Yeah. I'm assuming. That's I know it just worked perfectly. And let me see. I remember doing a Bee Gees record where they they called and said, "Just bring just bring a guitar and an amp. All we want is power chords." And I and I said to the guy, "Well, there's a lots of different kinds of power chords. I mean, there's Pete Townsend power chords, which really aren't that distorted, and then there's Van Halen power chords, which are, and then there's things in the middle." So I said, maybe I should, you know, have my cartridge company bring some stuff. So they brought down about seven or eight different amp heads and some different cabinets and two trunks of electric guitars. And what it ended up being, I'll never forget, was a thin line telly with a little bit of semi crunched sound on it and a Rickenbacker 12 string mixed. So it wasn't, it wasn't really power chords at all. It was more just crunchy chords, you know. So that was their perception of... of and you have to filter that out as a session player. Yeah, you just have to kind of second guess what they want because they don't really know. <laughs> That's really cool. So, 
I'm still and one of my most one of my most uh, uh, memorable sessions of all time. Uh, I got a call one day when I was practicing some Chet Atkins music. I was I was just married. My wife comes in, and goes, "What are you doing?" I said, "Honey, this is Chet. This is very important." I was playing like Camp Town Races or something, <laughs> really cokey. And she goes, "Man, that's the corniest stuff I've ever heard." You know, we're just married. She thinks she's married this artist with integrity and artistic <laughs> vision or everything. So uh, ten uh, ten minutes after she leaves, I get a call and say, "Can you, this guy says, can you play in the style of Chet Atkins?" So I said, yeah, listen to this. I'm doing it now. So he asked me to come down to the studio and play the uh, the Albertson supermarket theme in the style of Chet. That's wild. And he had it written in the key of C, and I transposed it to E. And within 45 minutes, I'd recorded a 60-second and a 30-second version. So I came home and told my wife, hey, man, I made money on that stuff you thought was corny. She goes, yeah, whatever. I said, well. <laughs> I got double scale because I was the only guy on the session, solo guitar. So that's going to be, you know, 165 bucks for the 45 minutes. She goes, yeah, whatever. Well, little did we know that it was in the early 80s, and little did I know that uh, they every time they change the copy on the jingle, whether whether they're selling Chuck steak or bananas and oranges, they have to pay me again. Oh, so, wow. So, and it was for the Northwest, the Southwest, the Midwest, the South, the Northeast, and the Southeast. So all these different Alberts and supermarkets, wherever they were in the, in the country, was saying, you know, Holy. So did you- toilet paper. So I never made less than 1855 bucks a month for the next four and a half years. That's, a, that's great. And sometimes man. I made like 2400 or three grand. You know, it was just manna from heaven. Did you have like the Albertsons wing of your house? Yeah, I tell you, man. <laughs> house, bought a house over it. That's great, it man. The most amazing steady income. And then uh, one day the guy called me four and a half years later and said, well, we lost the Albertsons gig. And I said, well, we had a good run, you know. So a few days later I get this call from the producer saying, we need you to play on this REO Speedwagon album. I said, great. I love those guys, you know. So it was the <clears> – <throat> You know, send your cartage down for tomorrow morning. It was uh, the complex, the studio owned by Earth, Wind, and Fire. So I sent all my gear down there, tell them to tune up the Les Pauls, you know, make sure everything's ready to roll. But that night I got a call from this other composer saying, hey, man, are you busy tomorrow? And I said, yeah, I'm too cool, man. I got this, uh, I got a record date, you know, sorry, can't make your jingle. And I go, by the way, what was it? And he goes, Alberts. And I said, just a minute, man. Let me make some calls. So you switched up and you did the Albertsons thing again. Yeah, I did it, but it was it was with a like a string quartet, so the money got divided up more. Not it didn't all go to be. Yeah, so, but still, man, continuity is continuity. You know, that's yeah, I know. great. Good for you, man. That's a good story. Those was, are some memorable sessions, I'll tell you. <laughs> dude, was that so? You never did the REO Speedwagon, or did you sub that well, out? Or call me back. I mean, uh, before I even got there, they said. Uh, because uh, I had said, don't you guys have a guitar player? And they go, yeah, but he's skiing in Switzerland, and we got to get this done. We need a solo and some power chords and stuff. So uh, so that was Carol, Gary Richrath was still. Yeah, when they called Gary over there, he jumped on the next plane. So maybe I was pawn in game of yeah role. So, but uh, I got paid for it anyway. Good for you, man. Have, do you know Dave Amato, their new player? I know him really well, yeah. Just Matter of fact, my man. I had Stu Ham on bass, and, and we opened for REO, and they told me, all those guys told me, and they still tell me, we're the only opening act that the entire REO Speedwagon actually stood in the ring, wings and watched. That's cool, man. Yeah, it was a really good compliment. I love Dave. He's a good cat. Wonderful guy, man. Real sweet guy. I mean, incredibly yeah. nice person, man. And that band is fun to see live. Man, I saw them recently. They were down here. I, I, <laughs> I was shocked. Um What's his name? Uh, I'm having a Kevin. brain. Kevin, he's yeah. literally one of the best front men I've ever seen. His rapport, and he knows how to engage the crowd, man. I mean, he was just incredible. I was really blown away by how good the show was. Yeah, he still got it, too, which is great. Oh. Still, still stings really well. Hey, same thing for people you've given lessons to. Can you talk about three cool or interesting lessons that you gave? Well, uh, you mentioned that I, I taught John Fogarty, and he just called me up out of the blue saying, can you show me some of this uh, country stuff that uh, that I saw on a video? 
And uh, I said, sure. So I went over there and he threw the video away and we, we started, started giving him like two to three lessons a week for about a year. Wow. And that was really fun. And, um, you know, he, it was just great to sit across from him and say, um, you know, this is the, cause he was asking me all this stuff. He wanted to know how Hendrix played. He wanted to know how Freddie Green played chords in the Count Basie band. He wanted to just pick my brain about everything. And I really admired that because yeah. he just, I think he had just turned 50 or 55 or something. And uh, that went on for a really long time. And then um, I've given a few lessons to uh, James Valentine from, from the Maroon 5. I, I interviewed James, another very, very nice guy, deep guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's, a, he's a serious player, you know, he's he, really good guy. Um, <laughs> you mentioned the guy from System of, System of Down. His name is Chavo, and he's actually a bass player. And he was he was difficult to teach because he tunes down a whole step and then tunes his E string down even farther. So I oh, had a wow. whole new concept. I'm not even a bass player, but I, he needed to know scales and theory, and you know, he just I don't think he knew where the notes on the instrument were. So we we worked on that for a while. So sounds like me. <laughs> 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 um. Favorite movies or TV soundtracks you worked on and why? Well, one of my favorite movies was Ratatouille for, for Michael Giacchino. That was really fun because you had to play gypsy jazz stuff and you had to play mandolin. And uh, that was really good. I also did Cars 2. Uh, and that was like surf guitar and spy guitar. Um, I played a lot of heavy metal on that movie The Crow years ago. Great movie soundtrack. Yeah, and you know, that was interesting because I'd never worked for the composer. His name was Graham Ravel, and I walked into his, his studio, and he had written out this part. But at the time, but in the, on, the, on the screen, the crow guy was shredding up the guitar neck, and then he takes it and throws it over, over the top of a building, right? So, so I said to the composer, you know, with all due respect, sir, I could read this, but... I'm kind of, as a guitar player, I'm kind of calling BS on it because I see his hands doing something completely different. And uh, I think I think you should just roll tape and let me improvise. Good and for you. Did. Good. And he did. He, and so he, he rolled tape. I, I just played a blazing run, and then I hit a chord or hit a harmonic and then just did a wang bar dive on a stunt guitar, you know, like with a Floyd Rose on it. Sure. And uh, then did a big kind of a sound. Yeah, and that, was, that was it. And then he said to me, from now on, I'm going to pay you double scale, but I'm also going to pay you uh, $200 an hour to ghostwrite for me. And awesome. I'll write, I'll write you a check at the end of every session, too. So it became a great working relationship because until which time he would say stuff like, I don't have anything written. It's got to be in the style of uh, Hot Club Paris, you know, and it's, uh, it's for a movie about Anne Frank. <laughs> and there's nothing written, and I go, all right, here we go. Jink, 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 jink. <laughs> That's amazing, so, man. He started to really take advantage of that. So, but there's a good lesson there, I think, um, in being in in allowing your competence and in, in letting people know, hey, man, this is probably, you know, like you said, with, with all due respect, you know, this is probably the best way to handle it. And I think that that in general, when you're in the service business, that's an important thing to do because that's why you are getting paid in an, in, in the first place. Just to go in there robotically is like, yeah. you know, but, it, you know, it, it takes it takes years of doing this to get the confidence to yeah. be able to do that. You know, because in my sure. early career, I would have gone, "Yes, sir, let me read it and and, and read the music as best yeah. I could." You know, but but after a while, you go, ah. Uh, it's almost like when you're in high school and you have to figure out what the teacher wants on the essay as opposed to what you want to write. Yeah. Here's, here's what's going to get me the A because I know what she wants or he wants. Uh, and, and that's and that's kind of the mentality I took. That I know what he's after and this what he's got here isn't it. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's a part of confidence is realize when you walk into a studio or, or even on stage, you have to have the confidence to go, I'm the expert in the room. Yeah. I'm the expert on my instrument. You know, he knows about music and he knows about the soundtrack and the score and stuff. But uh, as far as being a guitar player, you know, we only have these six strings and these four fingers and a thumb. So we can't play eight string, eight note chords. We have to, 
we have to take a few out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That and that that happens a lot, you know. You just have to go in with that confidence. It, you have to, and it's 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 like that with any service profession. It's just like when you're dealing with a doctor. You know, you want that physician who's conf- You know, you're gonna feel co- it's no different than anything else. I think that's great, man, that you did that. And it, you know, it's interesting you played on Ratatouille. I actually remember listening to that and saying, "Man, this is great guitar on here." <laughs> yeah, that was a great soundtrack, man. I didn't, I didn't think I watched Cars too, but I, I remember watching Ratatouille with one of my kids, and that was great movie, huh? Oh, yeah, great movie, but the soundtrack was really cool on there, man. So too, yeah. How'd you get the gig with Super Tramp? And like, is there any sort of a like rock and roll story that you've witnessed or been a part of or seen on the road or anything? Oh man, there's hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> All well, right, good. Let's yeah, tap the doing, well. Uh, I was doing a record date um, for a female vocalist in a studio I'd never been to before, like Wildcat Studios or something. And the uh, engineer was an English guy, and he was really a good engineer. And he liked me and I liked him. We were getting some great sounds. And uh, I gave him my number and he gave me his. And then that night, I got a call from some guy, that from a guy named Norm, Norman Hall. <laughs> Norman Hall. And he said uh, he works for Super Tramp and that they were auditioning guitar players. And he had gotten my number from this English friend of his. And would I be interested in auditioning tomorrow morning you know, at 10 a.m.? And I said... Sure. Well, it was about 9.30 at night, you know, already. So I didn't have any chance to prepare anything. So, uh, I mean, learn any super trans yeah. songs. So at the time, my dear friend now, Rick Davies, lived in Encino, California, which is, and he had a big mansion up in the hills near Michael Jackson's house. And uh, um, anyway, I went up there the next morning and those guys were all playing tennis on the tennis court. And I... Uh, Went in the studio, plugged in, and uh, they came in, and we sat down, and I said, I got a confession to make. I really don't know any of your songs. I, I got the call late last night. I didn't have a chance. And they go, we don't want to play any of our bloody songs. Let's play the blues. <laughs> so we played the blues, and, we, uh, and they asked me to sing something, a few things. And, um, and as I was walking into the studio, Buzzy Featon was coming out, and That's- he's one of my favorites you know i'd learned a lot from playing with him a few times a lot of great r&b uh chordal stuff you know buzzy was super cool i go i don't have a chance on this man buzzy's my hero so anyway but that night they called me and said we auditioned 19 guys you were the 19th and uh you got the gig and they said call management tomorrow and name your price so that was a big lesson because I came in about four or five thousand dollars too low. Yeah, that's always tough, yeah. man. That's almost unfair, especially to like that was was that your first like international? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's. So, so, but I was only uh, twenty nine or something, you know. So I, I had really, I, I hadn't thought that one through. Well, you can't definitely. when you're twenty nine and you have. It's like you have no frame of reference here. That's yeah. Like, I mean, I basically went from playing. From to, from to 30 people a night to 20,000 people a night, you know? Yeah. And it was a, it was a great, it was a great thing. And I became, I was a side man on those first few tours. And then, uh, later on in, um, in the late, in the mid nineties, uh, th- there had been a, a, a lapse. They were trying to wait for their A and M contract to expire so that they could sign with EMI. So there would be an elapse with no records, and then, but Rick uh, Davies started get, getting people together at his house, just the, just the core guys, me and a bass player and a drummer, and another keyboard player, and we just started just jamming, uh, almost every other Wednesday or every Wednesday, and we did that for about a year. And at the end of the year, they said, "Well, the, some of the songs you've been working on are going to be on the new Super Tramp album," and uh, they. They were so generous. They say all those all those jams you did, um, you know. Here's a big check. I won't even tell you how much it was, but it was a huge check to say those those are we're, we're paying you for that. And we it's had been cool. doing it just to go over and jam with Rick and go out to have uh, Italian food afterwards, you know. So that's cool. It, it, it was a shock. And then they said we're going to make you a permanent. You're now a member of the band. You're not. That's a, great. Uh, not a side man. So you're not. They're not like Mick and Keith. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. That's very yeah. cool, man. It really yeah. that's yeah. almost unheard of too. Yeah, they they they're really cool guys. I just went to Long Island recently 
um, in the late in late August because Rick. So Super Tramp, you know, we toured through the late '90s, then 2002, and then 2010. I mean, these are big arena tour type things, so they they mount them every four or five years, you know. <clears throat> Our last gig was like 2012. We played a festival in Barcelona or something, and then and then we were all set to do 2015 big arena tour, and we got the call. I think there were 36 arenas and they were sold out. And we got the call from management saying the leader of the band has contact contract cancer tour canceled. So he got something called multiple myeloma. Rick did. And we had to cancel that tour. And he's been in the recovery process all this time. Well, last uh, August uh, 27th and 28th, he did his first little pub gigs out there in the Hamptons, you know, in Long Island. Sure. And uh, he got G.E. Smith to play guitar. He's a neighbor. Yeah, that's of course right. Uh, he got a couple of, of local pub musicians, you know, a drummer, bass player, and another guy. And they kind of did some blues, you know, just blues tunes. Rick's always liked to play Muddy Waters and Chuck Berry and stuff at Soundcheck, not Super Tramp, you know, all that, all this kind of Ray Charles and uh, Bill Doggett, all these tunes he kind of loves, you know. So, so it was that. But I flew back and sat in on five tunes, and we actually did some Super Tramp tunes, and he sounded good. I don't know if he's got the energy to ever mount, you know, one of these tours with a sixty-man crew and seven or eight semis and all that. I don't know if he'll ever do that again and pull the band together again. But it was just really encouraging to see him on stage, and his voice sounds great. That's good, man. Yeah, that's a tough thing that to, I don't. How old is he? Uh, he's, he's 74. Uh, it's a yeah, tough thing to come back with at any age, you know? I know. Uh, top, is there a top three overall experiences you've had? With that band or with any, you know? No, in your whole musical career, man. Just, you know, things either because of this, the work you did, uh, and, and, or the, the satisfaction or the hang or just the, you know, you pulled through something that was, they told you you couldn't through, what what would be your top three? Well, uh, I would say that they probably all would be, uh, you know, play in live playing situations that are completely exhilarating. Uh, I remember, um, I remember playing in Hyde Park with super tramp for a huge crowd. I remember playing in a, in a Roman arena, you know, like a Coliseum, Nîmes, France, where the, full moon rose between those arches and you go, man, this has been a gig for 2000 years. You know? <laughs> Same with the Verona, the Coliseum in Verona. You're even there. Um, I've had some great festivals with my own band. Matter of fact, just this year we played this hippie festival where uh, it was in Bavaria, Germany. That's cool. And, uh, you know, a couple, about four or 5,000 people. And then we just played the Jimi Hendrix festival last this month in, uh, Another place in Germany. It was the last place Hendrix played before he died. And uh, it's called the, the Jimi Hendrix Festival on an island in the north of Germany called Feymarn Island. You know, those experiences are just great. It, it only had 4,000 people, but that was really cool. I remember playing for 180,000 people with Supertramp in France one time. Wow. Uh, I was just going to say how, how uh, you know, what a how what good fortune you've had to sit and say it was only four thousand people. I mean that's really awesome, you know. I mean yeah, seriously. My band, my band usually is between you know two fifty and six hundred. You know that we can draw. Yeah, but I mean, what a you know a good career that you know only for, like a lot of guys never get to play in front of four thousand. Man, you know what? A, you've had such good experience, man. It's, it's so yeah, cool. I played, I played a a fun gig. It was about a year ago, June. It was at Sweetwater in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It was like a guitar festival, and on stage with me was um, Andy Timmons, Dweezil Zappa, uh, Greg Koch, and uh, and Eric Johnson. Holy and, crap! And, and we all got a chance to you know play, and it was really fun. And everybody sounded like themselves and very different. But that was a good one, you know. I, I've interviewed Andy and Greg and almost every musician I've ever spoke to, the one guy they point to as the beacon of work ethic is Greg. Oh, really? Yeah. They, I mean, that he's always at it, you know. It was, uh, yeah, he's, he's a great guy. Such yeah. a 
character. Yeah, I couldn't believe I met him at Nam. He's like six foot five yeah. or something. He's a big giant dude. Get, get me a get me a six foot five Jim Carrey. <laughs> <laughs> he has that kind of humor, you know. Yeah, what a, I remember what a, we played something. We played in Italy together, and then the following few months later, we ended up in London together. And uh, but I always enjoy playing with him. He's such he's really strong. Yeah. You grew up in Pasadena, you said. Mm-hmm. What was your childhood like? Oh, it was great. You know, my parents were very uh, supportive. And my dad, my dad's advice to me was, whatever you do, make sure it makes you happy. You know, whatever you end up doing for a living, just make sure that it makes you happy. And boy, was that words to live by. Yeah, you know? that is great. What did he do? What, did, what kind of work did your dad do? He was in the uh, aerospace, aerospace business. He owned, he started and owned a company called Astropack, which is cleaning and packaging, like cleaning, clean room cleaning of uh, of uh, you know things on the Apollo missions and Gemini missions and space shuttle and stuff. And then they eventually branched out into anything, you know, nuclear submarines, parts for Boeing aircraft. Um, pipelines, you know, anything they could. My brother runs it now. My dad's retired. But he actually played drums when he was a kid. Your dad? Little, yeah. That's cool. His man. drum set got stolen, which ended his musical career. But uh, he played a little drums, and he played the ukulele. <laughs> That's cool, man. Really yeah. cool. What were, and maybe, there may not have been any of you, but I had a question. What are the, some of the lower points or some of the bigger obstacles you had to deal with throughout your career that you had to overcome, if there was anything? I mean, I got to admit, I've been pretty lucky. There wasn't any obstacles. There was a few times when I was up for a gig, maybe that I didn't get it. Um, I remember, uh, I remember auditioning for Don Henley's band right after that Dirty Laundry tune came out, and I showed up at the audition knowing the tunes that they asked me to learn, but I knew the guitar one parts, and I had no idea there was another guitar player on the gig already. And he uh, he was guitar one, and I was supposed to know the sort of background type parts. Um, Henley played guitar? No, no, uh, th- th- this other guy. Oh, the other guy, okay. A friend of mine named Kevin Dukes. So I was going to be guitar too. So I auditioned, but I didn't know the right parts, and they were leaving a week from Friday. So I said, uh, I could learn this. This isn't tough, you know. And he, Henley said, yeah, man, you're a great player, but we need somebody who already does it. We're going to call Danny Korchmar who's since since become a buddy of mine i've you know well anyway it didn't work out with danny or he didn't want to do it so the following week they called me back and they go we interviewed everybody in the band about who their favorite player that we heard was they all said you you got the gig we leave friday you know learn the material and i said uh i can't i've already got too many commitments between now and then that i'd have to turn down there were there were good things to be doing like a week on this record or a you know sure. big, big stuff so that was maybe, maybe i should have canceled all that and done the don henley tour maybe it would have opened some doors down the road maybe that was a mistake also i got called to do this library music at the dawn of libraries <laughs> It you mean libraries like, like for sinks for licensing yeah, stuff? Yeah, this was eighty nine ninety, right? The dawn now. of libraries. <laughs> yeah, there, 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 there was a company called um, Killer Tracks that was starting this library thing, and they were the first to do it. And so they said, "We want to hire you, non union. We'll pay you a hundred bucks an hour, eight hours a day, six days a week for a month." Uh, and I said, "I'll do it as long as we can start at three in the afternoon, so I don't just completely lose all my other session work." I was sure. busy enough. Wow. I was doing I was doing the Young Riders TV show, and of course Cheers, and a bunch of different shows that were ongoing, and people's records and jingles. So, so it was like three to eleven. Is that eight hours? Yeah, yeah, three to eleven every day. Right after it started. They started saying, hey, uh, the band's getting ahead of the composers. We need you to start writing stuff, and we'll pay you to play on your own tracks, and we'll pay you to write them, and you get your writers. You know, We'll keep the publishing. You get your writers. I had a, you know, And they'd say, we need something warm and fuzzy with flugelhorn and, and nylon string guitar by tomorrow, by tomorrow. So I'd go home and write it, you know, and uh, we need a three-horn James Brown chart by three tomorrow afternoon, you know. We got the horns hired. It's going to be trombones, you know. Okay, I can do that. So 
Right in the middle of all that, Alan Holsworth calls me for a tour. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, uh, the opportunity cost was probably to do that tour would have been too big, man. I know, you know, and, I, you know, his tours probably didn't pay that much at the time, 89, 90. And I was making money hand over foot. You, man, know? you were making 20 grand a year with the 20 grand a month with the first whack. Yeah, I know. So it was. It was with a heavy heart that I said, Alan, I just can't do it right now. I can do the next one, but or if the tour starts in October, I can do it. But and I've always thought about that as possibly being, you know, I took money over art. I made a big mistake. And uh, you know, so you know, there are there are mistakes and, and yet I gotta say that the songs I wrote for the library have paid me uh, you know, royalties yeah. and musicians. Uh, 30 years later almost, you know, so, you know, can't be two places at once. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't agree with that. I think you gotta, you can't always do one thing, you know, you can't always, you know, say, Hey, I'm always going to choose art over money. And that's just a two, I mean, life doesn't work like that. You know, it's elastic. Yeah, the reality for musicians nowadays, especially, oh. is that it's really about multiple income streams. Yeah. You know, you, you do some educational stuff, you do some live stuff, you do some studio stuff, you do some production stuff, um, and 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 you have your royalties coming in from uh, songwriting and from you know, uh, there's a thing called the special payments fund. It's actually now called the musicians' secondary market fund, which means every movie or TV show that you ever played on and you were paid for, what you were paid for was a U.S. release. But if they're rerun or if they're sold, well, if they're sold as a DVD or if they're streamed or if they're played on an airplane or played overseas, like in Japan or China or Europe or anywhere, you get paid again. So they yeah. Im- they impute some value factor for each one of those things because, yeah, yeah that's pretty there cool. There are musicians that, that I know in L.A. that every July 1st get a check for a quarter of a million dollars. Great. Good for them. Plenty of them, you know. That's and great. I'm not nearly that high, but I'll tell you, man, it's a it's a beautiful thing. Cause great. It's a one lump sum thing. And, and, and as, for instance, I played on all those Scrubs episodes, you know, the TV show Scrubs. Yeah. Every, it seems like every year they rec- they release on DVD or streaming or something another season, and then everybody goes and buys all that, you know, and then you get paid again. Good. So it's the, they call it the secondary market fund because it's yet another market, and it, it, it and uh, you know there will be uh, yeah people can stream stuff on their phones, so you, you get paid for that. It's a great deal. Sounds like someone needs to develop the tertiary market fund then. Yeah, now you're <laughs> I hey, like the way you think. <laughs> I told you, I'm a marketing guy. Yeah. Uh, who's your favorite guitar player? <laughs> I know, it's, I know. Right? It's pretty silly, you know. And, and uh, I mean, you know, one day it'll be Ry Cooter, and the next day it'll be uh, Dwayne Allman, and the next day it'll be uh, John Schofield, and the next day it'll be uh, Eric Clapton. You know, so it's it's all over the place, and. I don't even have a favorite country guitar player, you know, because yeah. I've learned from I've learned from uh, Hank Garlin, and I've learned from I did a session with Brent Mason not too long ago, and oh, cool, and I've played many, many times with Albert Lee. You know, he's been he and I have seemed to hit the same festival circuit together. So, you know, it, it, you, I really can't answer that. And, and uh, who's uh, let me ask you this: Who moves? Hmm? Who moves you emotionally? that you wind up gravitating to listen to in your free time more, more often than not. I'll tell you right now, it's got to be Derek trucks. Yeah. I really get an emotional charge out of his playing. It's just so powerful. And I think that the, I spent a lot of time taking my guitar and trying to emulate the, what, what a slide player can do only without a slide. Hmm. You know, in other words, I've learned how to play Statesboro Blues every Dwayne Allman lick, but without the slide. Yeah. Just to see if I can get the bends to sound like that. And the same goes with a lot of Derek Truck stuff. Those guys really knock me out. But I'm also, you know, I'm also knocked out by Eric Clapton's work in the Cream, you know, in Cream. Oh, I love his stuff with Cream, man. Yeah. To me, it's just a, an epic thing. And, and, and 
there's there's moments in Voodoo Child, the long version of Voodoo Child by Hendrix on Electric Ladyland, where you know he's just burying his soul there, you know, and that 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 emotionally will move me. But um, yeah, there's there's but there's not there's not one guy, you know. I, I, I'm I'm influenced by people like uh, Stephen Stills. I thought he was a great Bla- yeah. Black Queen. That whole album. Yeah. Oh my Black god! Queen. I mean, that album man, it, just, it just still really holds up, doesn't it? I just listened to it last week. It's phenomenal, yeah. man. It's that guy was yeah. It's, the that writing Clapton solo, that Clapton solo on "Go Back Home," you know, is really killer too. Yeah, I love that. Song. Thank but, you. Wait. Go back home. Yeah, great tune, That's man. Wawa. Yeah. Oh, go back to the Wawa, man. The last <laughs> thing I would have thought is Frankie Avalon and Annette Funicello. What did they need a Wawa for? Well, so Frankie had just had a re-hit, a second hit, with the song Venus. But it was Disco Venus. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, Venus, if you do, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And it was, it was Disco era. Okay, know? yeah. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's quite that's funny. Yeah. What's your man? I is it? Do you, how many guitars do you have? Do you even know? I think there's around seventy, but I I wow. tell my wife fifty. Yeah, yeah. Every, every guy does that I talk to. <laughs> what um? Do you have like a go to guitar? Not forget about studio needs. Like forget about the tool aspect. I'm talking about what is your go to guitar? That man, the one you reach for that you just love playing above all others, which has got to be tough with seventy guitars. Yeah, it's tough, but you know the 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 one I'll reach for. I tell you, um, I came off the road the other day playing my LSL CV special, and it needed strings. And I set it on a stand saying, I'm going to string this up. And since I've been off the road, I've almost exclusively just picked it up and played it, even though I got all these other guitars. So, you know, that's going to change. I'll get home today and say, maybe I'll pull out my Flying V or something. (laughs) But I think my heart and soul is in the Stratocaster. I can do most of what I want to do on the Strat, you know. when I'm playing a telly, I, I end up sounding a little bit country and, and aiming that way with double stops and stay in tune. Hmm. Um, and a telly is a fantastic instrument. You know, you, you, I think if you spend a week on a telly, you become a better player because it's so bare bones and so just such a simple machine that you, you, you get it out of your hands to, to, to the shades and colors you want. Um, but when the time comes that I need to play a Gibson, I do have a whole armada of all the important gibson guitars armada and, uh, <laughs> yeah, a fleet a fleet of gibsons what's your favorite gibson that you have well let me see you know what's really fun to play is is i got a 66 sg and it has a it has a small neck which is you can't yeah. do everything you want to do but it's a real fast neck and you end up really shredding on it and uh, it sounds good too it also works great in super tramp because there's always a couple of keyboards going on whether it's the Wurlitzer and the organ or a piano and a Whirly or a piano and organ or a synth or two. So that SG tends to cut better than a Strat. A Strat for me is a little bit more open sounding. Hmm. And, uh, especially a Strat with like EL34 Marshall you know, tubes. Um, that's a more open, big sound, whereas the, the SG is more of a beam tone that cuts. So I, I like that sound in that band. What's uh, you ever sell a guitar that you regret? You know, this is a funny thing, man. I sold. I was at this party with these guitar players. It was Joe Bonamassa, Howard Leese, Steve Lukather, Seymour Duncan, George Lynch, Wolf Marshall. All these guys, you know, and the, most of those guys I mentioned are Gibson guys. Yeah. Right? And this guy named Bill Nash, who makes Nash guitars. guitars. Yeah. Nash guitars. He was there. And he handed me this Les Paul, and I picked it up and started playing it. I'm like, God, this thing's great. It's lightweight. It plays great. I pass it to Luke, you know. He passes it to Joe. It goes all the way around the table. Everybody's going, wow, this feels really good. Came back to me, and I said, what do you want for it? I'll buy it. It was a Nash a Nash. Yeah, guitar. the Nash yeah. guitar. So I took it home, and I already had a 1972 Les Paul that I put some real PAFs in it. You know, the patent applied for humbuckers that are so valuable. I got them out of a 175 jazz guitar. And uh, so I put, I had my, my tech switch it out, put the PAFs in 
the Nash guitar. And I got some Seymour Duncan antiquities I had laying around. I put those in my 72, put it on Craigslist, and it sold in 25 minutes. A guy said, are you really Carl Ryan? I go, yeah. He goes, and I'd never done Craigslist before. Yeah. So he goes, I live down the street. I'll be right up. So he, he, half an hour later, he shows up, gives me cash for it. Then I get the Nash guitar back with the PAFs in it, plug it in, and it does not sound good. It did not sound like a Les Paul. Oh, so, wow. wow. That's really. It, 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 so I call up my tech guy and I said, man, this is, something's wrong. This does not sound like it, what it needs to sound like. And he goes, well, you know it's it's chambered, right? You know it's a hollow one, right? Oh, huge mistake. I had no idea it was a hollow one. So it played great, looked great, you know, beautiful sunburst on it, but it didn't sound like a Les Paul. So I was dismayed. Um, I decided to start looking for another Les Paul. So I looked and looked and looked, right, for a year. And I have a few buddies that own music shops. And I said, keep your eye open. and I'll pay five, six grand, whatever it takes to get a, a non-chambered Les Paul. One year later, my band was playing at the Canyon Club, which is a big 600-seater in L.A. And, you know, when you're done, you go down to the merch table and you're signing autographs and stuff. This guy comes up to me and he goes, hey, man, remember me? <laughs> I said, no, I'm sorry to say I don't remember you. And he goes, I'm the guy that bought that Les Paul from you a year ago today. So I just grabbed him by the lapels and I said, man, I hope you play that thing every day because I really miss it. I never should have sold it. I played it on tons of records in the past, including my own records. I, I made a big mistake by selling. He goes, well, listen, I just played it for a couple weeks and put it in the closet. I don't think I've taken it out since. I don't think I ever even changed the strings. I'll sell it back to you. So I said, name your price. So he came over the next day, same price. Oh, that was that really I, cool. And I put the PAFs back in it, and I've played it ever since. Oh. And, you know, the reason I sold it was I had just been influenced by an article in Vintage Guitar Magazine saying that um, the uh, 70s were a real low point in the history of Gibson. You know, they were owned by yeah. Nolan and they had cement factories and, you know, all over the world. And they, you know, they, they were not really worried about quality. And, but nevertheless, there are some nice lightweight Les Pauls that they made in that period, 72. And mine was a special order because that guitar, the Deluxe, should have had the mini humbuckers. So mine was a special order with, with T-top pickups, which were regular size humbuckers. So anyway, long story short, I got it back and now I sell anything <laughs> holy smokes good for you man yeah that was lucky desert island discs is it possible top three wow. just just for today no particular order knowing it'll change tomorrow all right I, I i anticipated this question and i wrote down uh wheels of fire by cream cream great oh what a great record man i also wrote down allman brothers live at the fillmore where i learned every lick you know another great life. record I also wrote down Electric Ladyland, uh, and then I wrote down an album by Pat Martino called We'll Be Together Again, which is just Pat and a keyboard player, the whole record, but it's one of the most sublime, perfect records. And uh, those those records were, you know, major impact on my childhood, you know. Yes. But when you say Desert Island, that's a funny thing because I've listened to those records so much I can sing every note. So yeah, yeah. You're, you're really, it would probably be newer stuff that, I, that is brilliant that I don't really know that much. <laughs> so. Very cool, man. Thanks. Carl, what is, like, what, what's the most important thing or things you've learned about you throughout your career and just life in general? Hmm. I would say that uh, early on I realized that to practice the guitar and to play at the level I want to play at, uh, I need to keep myself completely enthralled and interested. And therefore, I learned early on that instead of compartmentalizing my practice time and saying I need to practice country music for 15 minutes, then switch to jazz, then switch to sight reading, then switch to nylon string classical guitar repertoire and that kind of stuff instead of doing it that way i'm better off saying i'm gonna i'm gonna learn this albert king solo and if it takes me three days to get the phrasing exactly like i want it i just do it 
And then I'm tired of Albert King and I'm going to work on Albert Lee for a while or, uh, you know, or something else. In other words, just keep yourself motivated and interested and excited about it. Another thing that I find really valuable is, is the free, the freedom of opening up your practicing to just play whatever comes to your mind, you know, cause so much of my practicing is, is devoted to the next performance, you know, like for instance, I'm going to play with Steve Vai tomorrow. Um, he's got this jamathon thing going on in LA where he's invited all these guitar yeah, players I saw on, that. on stage. So I'm one of the guys I play eight o'clock Saturday night and I'm playing with Steve and the drummer's my old friend, Chad Wackerman, who's been on a bunch of my records. So when I get home today, I'm going to be thinking, how can I kill on that? Not suck. <laughs> my mom, <laughs> how can my I, not is, I suck? Not suck, you know, so yeah, I want to just call a blues with Steve Vai. He's not really a blues guy. You want to come up with something that will make him interested, make the audience blown away and everything. So, so much of my practice is devoted to the next performance, you know, um, whether it's solo acoustic or my band or a situation like this where I'm sitting in with somebody. But I also really try to make sure that I get time to just play for the sheer joy of hearing the notes in the air. You know, yeah. like I'll play a line in the key of B major and I get to the top of that line and it might be the D sharp. Well, that's the seventh of F minor. So my next line is in F minor and I'll go down the guitar and then I'll say, uh, you know, maybe I'll go back up in the key of D seven, you know, mixolydian mode and just 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 play whatever comes to mind. And that oftentimes will uh, trigger something to write down in my lick book, some kind of a new line for a key or a tonal center or even a riff for a song. You know, I, I try to afford myself some of that time, too. And uh, so you really I've learned, learned that, that, that that's a great way to practice yeah. as well. I mean, not noodling in front of TV, but actually um, actually consciously just trying to be creative that 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 idea that's great man how about that question what learned about yourself off music stuff hmm. just about you as a person i i, I learned that i i have a, a a real work ethic you know that that monday through friday i'm working eight hours a day whether i'm out and out doing things on the road or 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 whether i'm doing sessions I'm, I'm actually i'm actually at home um organizing the next tour um or with my agents or whatever or or um working on stuff for the cv academy or working on a new tune or practicing it's it's basically a nine to five job and there are there's a lot of musicians out there that that are musicians because they don't like to get up in the morning you know, they, they, they realize it's a gig they can sleep in on. But yeah, I, you know, I, I, I there's a lot of people become real estate agents for that reason and school teachers. And man, I think anybody who goes into any career because of what you don't have to do, I that, that's a yeah. bad formula, man. You're not going to be successful. I mean, you're, you're, you're lazy, basically, to, to right. me, yeah. Yeah. to me, you know, I just I think mean, my dad always told me if you work hard, you will succeed. Yeah, you know, I don't care what you're doing. You, if you work hard, you will succeed, and that's pretty good advice, man, for for anybody. And yeah. so, I think I learned that about myself that that uh, I want to work hard. I also feel that success isn't necessarily, you know, making the cover of Guitar Player magazine every other month. You know, it's it's more being able to do what you want creatively, you know, artistically, and still feed your family and not have them suffer because you want to be this artist. Yeah. No, <laughs> you know I, I mean? I'm totally I with you, man. I think that's a good definition of success that you're doing what you want to do. And yet you're meeting all your responsibilities, you know, with your family. And stuff, yeah. So totally agree with you on that. Tough question, man. What do you like most about you? Oh man. I, I asked uh, a musician this one. I asked somebody, I talked to his musicians and, he, and he, this is a classic uh, musician answer. He goes, how can I answer that question when I have so much self-loathing? <laughs> it was somebody in LA. You might know him. You know Adam Zimmon? Great guy. 
He plays oh, at Ziggy. Yeah. Blonde hair guy plays at Ziggy. He's, yeah, really sweet guy. It was so yeah. funny when I he said I have so that. much self loathing. Um, yeah. How can I um, answer that question? I have so much self loathing. I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, a perfect answer would be I love my confidence. <laughs> <laughs> because Touché. You know, I'm confident enough to say that I love I love me. my confidence. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. That's I don't funny. know. I mean, I, 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 you know, I got a lot of. I got a lot of things to work on, as we all do. You know, yeah. that, that try to get be be a better this or that, or sure. husband or father or whatever. But um, I I I like I like the fact that um, you know my my musical style is such that you can you can pick it out in just a few notes. You know, I mean, I've been told that by many people. I knew it was you on that record or on that tv show or something and and, and i think that's a, a the quality that um i learned early on from you know even i read an article by santana of all people who said um uh, i play my guitar and when i hear something that doesn't sound like my heroes i take a note of that because that's me you know when i sit here there's something so that's that's the same with me if i if i'm playing along and i go yeah i got that from listening to Sonny rollins or Miles Davis or Eric Clapton or uh, Hank Garland, <laughs> you know, all the different influences because there are hundreds and hundreds that come to mind. You know, when I hear something that doesn't sound like any of those guys, that's me. I write it down. I transpose it to all 12 keys. I learn it major, minor and dominant. I get it under my hands. Um, and I think that's something that that I, I got to say I, I dig about, <laughs> about my myself the fact that there is a style there and i'm not just a a blank canvas that you know yeah but let me credit, credit to you man the reason you're not a blank canvas is the things you just told me you do i learn it and then i transpose it into all keys and then i play it this and that and then i do upside down you know there's there's no uh no free lunch right yeah yeah you <laughs> put in the hours you know yeah, you yeah. that's yeah. that's what you that's what allows you to do that Flip side, man, if you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? Hmm. Uh, I wish I didn't like cheese so much. Oh, come on. That's... <laughs> we have a cheese club. We only meet quarterly, these musicians and their wives, and you know, we bring different cheeses and drink wine and, and try all this. That sounds you know, great, it's man. It's really fun. but, but uh, That's a reason yeah. to like cheese. Yeah, I know. That's it. Uh I don't know. I could probably drink a little less, you know, if I, if I was smarter. <laughs> well, you're in good shape. You'd never know, man. Oh, that's good. Tell me something about yourself people would either be surprised to hear or might find a little odd. Hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm into cars. I, I like cars. I like, I, uh, I've had a tour of the Ferrari factory, the Porsche factory, uh, AMG and Mercedes engine development. Uh, and although I, you know, I don't have a bunch of exotic cars or anything like that. I dig that. I even like washing my car. That's cool, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're worried about the 70 guitars. I'd worry about the Ferrari and the Porsche before you tell your wife. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. What's a perfect day for you? Uh, just having some great creative time to practice and then some good, uh, some time with the people I love, my son and my wife, um, you know, a fine bottle of wine, a great dinner, you know. I mean, however, I, I had a day off in Stockholm a couple weeks ago, and for the first time in many years, I brought my wife on tour. I usually bring her to the end of a tour if she's going to get a little vacation, and we go to Vienna or, or uh, New York or something like that, you know. This time I said, this is a short little tour Places you've never been, you know, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, you want to go? She said, yeah. And we had a day off in Hamburg, which was a perfect day. But we had a day off in Stockholm, which was just sublime. You know, we went to uh, a couple of museums. We went to the Old Town for lunch, <clears throat> did three and a half miles of walking, uh, spent time. We took a water taxi around. That's cool. And uh, finally, we just had an amazing meal at a fantastic restaurant, and we had a suite in the hotel. So that's awesome. It was, it was a perfect day, I gotta say. How long have you been married, or with your wife? Years. Thirty-seven years. 
Yeah. Man, congrats. Which, which is really an accomplishment in the rock and roll business. I mean, it's an accomplishment for anything, but yeah, especially. <laughs> good for you, man. Congratulations. That is really cool. Very, very cool, man. Definitely congratulations. That's like 200 and something years for your wife in like musician years, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's had to endure. <laughs> but, you know, when you're out on the road for like four months or something, man, there's a lot of heartache that goes down. You oh, know, I can imagine. That. No, you I know, can't imagine. There, actually. I miss and and she and she she misses me, but she's a strong person and and into her own things. You mm. know, I think for a musician, you don't want a woman whose every, whose life is centered around you. And you it know, can, they, it's not going to work. Something that makes them tick too. Yeah, and um, you want to you want to float those kind of women out to sea, or if you're a woman, float those guys out. Yeah, because they're 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 never going to be happy with with what you do for a living. So. Man, I think if in any, no matter what you do, I, I think it's important that you each have your own thing because, like, at the end of the night, if you don't, what are you going to talk about? I mean, that'll right. work for a short period of time, maybe, man, but exactly over the long haul. Plus, you need your own breath of experience so that you can support each other, man. You know, they don't. I, I think so. Not that Keep I'm it a, interesting. That's that's a really good point. So. Yeah, I think so. Who's had the biggest influence on you, both musically and personally? Well, I would say. Personally, there was um, there was probably my wife, but musically there was a uh, a guy that I took lessons from in the late seventies named Joe Diorio. Do you, have you heard that name? I have. He's a jazz guy. As a matter of fact, I think he was originally East Coast and then was living in Florida for a while. And, you know, played with Jocko for a while, but he's a jazz guy that moved out to L.A. and um, he got me. He got me. Uh, he got me writing everything down. He says, you got to write everything down, man. And then he opened up this closet where he had a stack of notebooks, you know, waist high. And he opened them up and they're just musical ideas. And so I started that in about 78. And now I have a stack of notebooks. That's about great. <laughs> but so, so- he, 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 was, he was very creative, very artistic. He... he uh, uh, yeah, it, it was it was that write things down, and 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 he also got me thinking in terms of uh, playing non scalar stuff. You know, he says you just played a line, but the greatest interval you played was a whole step. That right? is so hard to do. Yeah, half steps and whole steps. He goes, listen to this. And then he play a line that had thirds, fourths, fifths, sixths, sevenths, octaves, and ninths. You know. And so he got me thinking about what is melodic, you know, and if you give da 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 if that's melodic to you, then that's what you got to play. But ba da ba da 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 that's melodic to me. He got me thinking in terms of intervals, and uh, uh, it, really, it really opened up my playing and the range on the instrument. Man, that is really smart. That's great stuff, man. Do you now go into those notebooks or like as I, you know, if you're stuck or if you just want to get some idea prompts, you just randomly pull some of them out? Once some, some yeah, terms? what you can do, you know, there's there's many ways to use that kind of practicing. First of all, you can play and something comes up that you've never played before that's interesting, you write it down. And the, a second way I use it is I'll play, I'll, 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 I'll go to the bank blank page uh uh the next blank page in my notebook and said you know two nights ago i was playing this extended show solo in f sharp minor and i really ran out of ideas i need some lines to start on this low f sharp on the second fret of the bottom string and end up on the high c sharp the highest note on the strat you know let me get some lines that do that and i'll work on them until i come up with something that's new different and write it down now that's a really long line and I'll, I got to say, the shorter the line, the more it's likely to uh, merge into what you already do. You know, the sure. Parents, the, the, the modes, whatever. But, uh, you know, so the blank page is the second way I do it. It's just come up with a line for B flat minor, you know, or whatever. The third way I do it is, yeah, I go back five pages, see what I was doing two months ago or six months ago or two notebooks ago. You know, I remember filling up an entire notebook with diminished scale ideas. And I get stuck for one of those and I'll just go, oh, man, I never learned this. Never got this under my hands. You'll see some stuff that you put a star next to, meaning I really got to get back and learn this. And I never did. So, 
that's a good a good way to uh, keep it fresh. Yeah, well, it's great that you're so passionate still after all these years that you've got the enthusiasm to keep doing that, man. That's really really cool thing to to see as an outsider, man. That's oh, really awesome. Has your life been different than what you'd imagined? In, in many ways, it turned out at this point in my life exactly what I promised myself, you know, which is work on a record, work on composing, get a record finished, recorded, go out on the road and play it. Uh, so it was it was sort of a six months in town, six months out of town, uh, uh, perfect world that I had in mind in my early 20s. Now, it's not exactly that, but it's time home and time on the road. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, I'm not six months out. And matter of fact, this year's kind of light. It's only about uh, two, maybe three months out. But I picked up this huge project this summer where I'm producing an artist. Um, and I'm doing it at Village Recorders, which is one of the top three studios in LA. And um, I've got, I had about 27 days in the studio with him. Wow. And about 40 more days pre-production helping him write his songs and stuff. That's great. It was fun. I used Alex Acuna on uh, percussion, you know, from Weather Report. And I used my band, including Jim Cox, Dave Murata, and John Mader on drums. And um, we, we did the tracks on a Monday and then, or a Monday, Tuesday, that I would spend the next five to seven days working on the guitar overdubs. Hmm. And, uh, boy, that was fun. Play mandolin and baritone and, you know, just all kinds of different things. That's great, man. Biggest business or personal win? Ooh, boy, that's a good question. Uh, would that involve financial gain or? Your call, man, whatever. Yeah. Huh. Whatever your gut reaction to that question. You know, if, 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 if I want to say personal win. Um, for some crazy reason, I've been collecting Guitar Player magazine since 1978. So when I made the cover last year, I, <laughs> very that, cool. That was a big thing for me, you know. I mean, and uh, I framed it and put it in my studio, and um, you know, that that, that was a that was a. Very and, cool. and you know, there are guys like my buddy Joe Bonamassa who makes it about once a year. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great. He's out there doing it and and nonstop and relentless touring and stuff like that, which is brilliant. So, but for me to just make it was was a wonderful. It felt like okay, I can relax a little bit <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> That's but good, I did. <laughs> man. That's good, man. Congratulations. How about the flip side, man? Big and if if you're uncomfortable answering, it's totally cool. Biz, biggest business or personal disaster? Huh? Disaster. Wow. Uh, there really haven't been any business disasters. As I mentioned that turning down the tour with Holsworth, um, th there was a, there was a date also in 2010 where, um, I had played on a Sylvie Vartan record and she's a French movie star singer. Um, I had taught David Halliday, who was her son, a few guitar lessons, um, which was a trippy experience. You had to go to his house you could charge whatever you wanted from the time you leave your home till the time you get back, you know, plumber style. Mm -hmm. The butler opened the car door for you and said, would you like tea today, Mr. Brian? And I said, yes, I would. <laughs> they go to the bedroom and the guy just wanted to learn Brian Adams tunes and he didn't, didn't, didn't want to learn, you know, he didn't even want to learn bar chords. Just let's go straight to, uh, straight to being a rock star. But at one point I got this call from uh, Johnny Halliday who was the um, biggest rock star of France. And his, his company said, would you, would you like to do a tour? Name your price, uh, and it's 14 months. That was and the kid's dad. The kid's dad, yeah. And this guy has been around for years. We don't know about him in America, but the Beatles used to open for him. That's oh, how my heavy gosh. He and uh, he drew uh, half a million people under the Eiffel Tower on the Millennial date you know when the, the um wow the, in 2000 yeah 2000, 1231 99 yeah, so 500, well, yeah. people I mean, this guy's he can draw you know and uh, he had a 14 month tour and they offered me nine grand a week and uh i 
they sent me over the record and I listened to it and I just couldn't get into it. And it was, <laughs> and it was like, he did Hey Joe, right? It was, hey Joe, voulez-vous ever, blah, 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 blah. And I, <laughs> oh man, I don't know. And, uh, and it, it just, it just didn't feel right. And, and so what is that? 36,000. Yeah, that's 36 times 14. That's, you know, yeah. like uh, close to half a million bucks. Yeah. So I had a tour coming up. I had a record coming out. I had some festivals and my son was going to graduate from high school. And I just decided, you know, I don't think I want to do this. And uh, I'll tell you what happened. I think he he slipped and broke, a, broke his back or broke his – and the tour – ended early and they got paid through the end of it. Wow. <laughs> so in hindsight, had oh. I done three months with them, it might have been a good thing to do. <laughs> that would have been the biggest return on investment in no kidding. music <laughs> history. <laughs> you know, I've heard I've heard that one wow. That's yeah, that's yeah. wild, man. I've heard that one time before. That is my he, buddy Jim Cox uh, he, he he had to do he was doing a Mark Knopfler tour. And uh, rehearsal started in London, and he was he had some ear infection, so he couldn't fly. So he took a train from L.A. to New York, got passage on a freighter to Antwerp, got another train to London, showed up at the rehearsal, and on the way into the first rehearsal, Mark Knopfler fell off a motorcycle and broke his collarbone. Tour canceled, and it was a four-month tour, and they he was sent home and uh, paid for the whole thing. I've heard that story because from somebody else, it wasn't your, who knew somebody, it wasn't your buddy, but someone who knew someone else on that tour. I heard that story before. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that wild? You know, the tour insurance kicks in and uh, there you go. Crazy, man. Do you have any hobbies outside of music? Uh, let me see. And cheese and wine? Yeah, I like to barbecue. Cool, like man. Grill stuff. Like and, what? Uh, so I do I do that regularly, and um, <laughs> let's see. My wife and I have gotten we got a little vegetable garden. We get into that, you know. That 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 shows you're getting old. Yeah, <laughs> I like to garden. <laughs> yeah, so. a little bit, but man, as long as you're having fun, it really doesn't matter, you know. Better to do gardening than sitting your ass. Yeah, we we've been growing some stuff, man, and uh, we had some pesto the other night. Man, I heard about you guys in California growing some stuff. Let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, not that stuff. Yeah, I'm is, thinking of getting into narcotics on Monday, though. I'm going to start that up. Is it? Is that? Is it like? So is weed like totally legal there for medicinal and non medicinal? Yeah, yeah. Do you people really, now, now? Can you walk down the street smoking? I mean, I'm not sure about that, but you do smell it everywhere you go. You know? Yeah, it's, it's it's out there. So um, we, we were at least you're not busted for it. You know? Yeah, yeah. We were in Colorado, like I don't know, say two and a half years ago, and it's stunk, but you can't you can't smoke it outside, even though it smelled it everywhere. You're not allowed to walk down the street. Everybody was doing it, of course, but because I was so I was curious, they just had some weird laws, and it was just like the, I'm not used to that. They don't have that here, so you go, I went. We went in dispensaries. It was like, you know, yeah. what do you want? Like What's that? Yeah, it's like Amsterdam. Yeah, it's but, what, yeah. But they were so descriptive of. You know, do you want this? And I'm like, man, I'm not going to know the difference. Just like right. I'm going to be done after one hit of whatever yeah, it is I, we I, buy. So, like, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, you yeah. just tell me which one, like, I will still be able to function, you know? So true, yeah. Um, toughest decision you ever had to make or hardest thing you ever had to do? Huh. That's, I'm just not recalling one, you know, I mean, I, I did, I did think hard about that, uh, turning down that, that Johnny Halliday tour. Um, I also turned down, a, I turned down a couple of other tours just cause it just didn't feel like it felt like a, uh, time out on my musical career, you know, yeah. like way back when I was offered George Michael and, uh, my buddy Carlos Rios said, you don't even play the first half of the show and you don't get to play on the song Faith, which was that kind of bow diddly groove on acoustic. Yeah, yeah. That's the whole that's on tape. He's got that on tape. And I just thought about it, man, I don't want to sit backstage while 
the rest of the band's out there and I don't want to not play on the one fun tune in the set. So no thanks, you know. Um, yeah, but you can't have a whole – you can't say yes to everything. That's, you know, yeah. I don't, that's not realistic, you know. Right. You know. And when you're building a solo career, I think certain sideman gigs are – going to elevate that and are going to give you more exposure you know totally uh, uh but but certain other ones are going to be just time out you're going to you're going to be disappeared from your core audience yeah gone. so no i think that's smart that's, to do yeah those, i think those are smart decisions to make yeah i mean when you first start in anything you got to say yes but not yeah. at this stage you know you, you got to can't say yes to everything because it just doesn't make sense you know exactly Hey, man, two more questions, and I can't thank you enough. You've been awesome. Oh, man. Best advice you've ever been given, and who gave it to you, if you can remember? Well, well, like I told you, my dad said, if you work hard, you will succeed, and whatever you do, make sure it makes you happy. Uh, that's really important advice. Um, and and I would say, over the years, just, just sitting with different players and jamming with them, um, people like I, I one time got this call from Larry Carlton who said, Hey man, my wife's got this gig in Texas. She's a singer. She's a contemporary Christian singer. Would you be interested in, uh, going down there and backing her up? And, 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 and I said, yeah, when's the rehearsal? And the gig was this Friday, you know, he's, he couldn't do it. And so he goes, ah, no rehearsal. Just come over to the house. I'll show you what I played on the record, which was just the coolest thing because, uh see that this was an a my an a seventh chord and here's what larry did on it you know and just just sitting with different guys like that over the years one time i got to play with brian may wow just the two of us two guitars you know and and uh played with steve morse um a few times you know and uh just you know those kind of things it's almost like it's not advice it's just you're you're absorbing their uh their vibe and their concept and you know just all of a sudden you see that's a whole other way of looking at it you know <laughs> that's great those, those are th- those musical things are, are, are fantastic over the years wow and the last question man what is the biggest change in your personality carl over the last 10 years and how much of this change has been deliberate and intentional and how much it's just a part of aging hmm. well i can i can answer that by saying when i listen to my old records um, I'm hearing stuff I'm really, really proud of. And I go, wow, how did I do that? And I'm also hearing stuff that I wouldn't do nowadays, you know, stuff that's just kind of over the top, uh, showing off non-musical stuff, you know? And so at this, at this age, I've kind of, the fire hasn't gone out. In other words, I can still shred all I want to shred, but I choose the moments and I think we're talking music, not necessarily personality, but it really relates to personality because uh, I think there's a little more taste, a little bit more restraint, um, and a little bit more, hopefully, timelessness in the playing to where you can't say, yeah, that sounds like 1987. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't I totally sound, do. It doesn't sound like 2018. It just sounds timeless. And hopefully in 20 years, I'll still be able to go, that was cool, you know. That's and I great. think that's a personality change more than a musical change, you know, because you, you, you still have the confidence, but now you know a little bit more, a little bit more seasoned, a little bit more aged, and uh, figure it out a little better. <laughs> man, that's awesome. Thank, thank you so much. I appreciate everything, man. Let me uh, tell people where to find you and uh, how to support you. First of all, uh, it's, it's Carl Verheyen. It's Carl, C-A-R-L-V-E-R-H-E-Y-E-N. And uh, check out his website at carlverheyen.com. A uh, few things that I want to uh, talk about. One is LSL or the two LSL guitars. Check them out. You know, I'm not going to lie and say I went to the store and check them out, but I saw them online. And if I was looking to buy a Strat, I would certainly without a doubt, consider that guitar. It looks amazing. And from what you said and how you described it, it sounds fantastic. And it's a, it's a gorgeous looking guitar, man. They, they oh. did a great job. What, what color? Sorry. They came in that blue. What else does it come in? Well, I used to have a Porsche 911 and uh, the, the, the midnight blue. I said, can you make it like this? They did, but it kind of looked a little black. So they lightened it up and that became the color. Yeah, it's but a, I, also a real have, nice I also have a white one. And uh, that, that's that's got some noiseless pickups in it that I you know replaced 
uh, that that little Fender of mine. I mean, I still play that little Fender, but this one is a a, a better guitar uh, with noiseless pickups, just in case you're in the studio and you need that. You know. Yeah. Um, so and then and then um, I have a few of their other guitars. I have two Tellys, and one is called the Soledad. And I, I recommend going online and looking up a video that every tune on this latest album of mine called Essential Blues, every tune was videotaped and it's on YouTube. And one is called um, uh, Someday After a While. Uh, it's an old Freddie King tune. And you can hear this. Uh, I love that. El Soledad, which is a telly that has been hollowed out behind the bridge and and then that little hollow area has two openings to two F holes. So it kind of acts as a speaker. Oh, that's cool. It's really, really an amazing guitar. It sits out on your lap like a telly, but it has a P90 in the neck and a humbucker in the bridge, which is, you wouldn't think those two pickups would work. Together, yeah. But they do really brilliant, brilliantly the way he's got them figured out. The middle, the middle position sounds kind of like a Gretsch. You know, I've got an old 6120 from 1959, and I can get that sound in the middle position, but then a beautiful, fat, jazzy P90 sound in the neck, and then a rocking humbucker in the back. So if you check out this tune um, someday after a while, you'll be sorry. You'll hear that thing, and I use that all the time. That's a great guitar. Very cool. And so that's LSL. Check it out. It's the Soledad, and then it's also the CV, the Carver Hay and Models. Also, um, Carl's last album is doing really well. You ought to check it out. It's, he just mentioned it's called Essential Blues, and you can s- listen to it and buy it all the regular places and all, all the or, you know the usual places you buy music, and it's also on his website again, which is carlverhyen.com. And he's got something really cool that he was talking to me about before we started. It's called CV Academy. And it's basically online lessons, but it's not, it's a lot more than that. And so let me shut up. And the two things that I thought were really cool that you mentioned, and you might want to share this is you have the, what I learned from, and then you had licks and then you just have so like a lot of personal anecdotal things that are, I thought were super interesting. So maybe talk about that. Well, so I, I, uh, the, what I learned from section there's probably 50 different lessons on there that are five to 10 minutes in there. The artistic signature of players that have influenced me over the years. And it starts with people like Roger McGuinn and George Harrison gets into Clapton and Hendrix and Page. Then it gets into West Montgomery and Grant Green and Pat Martino. And then it gets into Chet Atkins and Lenny Bro. Then it gets into Dwayne Allman and Ry Cooter and Derek Trucks. Then it gets into Joe Satriani and Steve Morse. And then it gets into, you know, you can just go down the list. I made a list of everybody that I've taken things from. And there are, some of them are contemporaries, like like Robin Ford or Steve Lukather, you know. Here's what I learned from Luke, you know, just sitting with him, playing with him, or transcribing his stuff. Just, just little musical ideas that I've incorporated into my own playing. And it's that big mishmash of... You know, and then and then there's this is what I learned from Sonny Rollins. I transcribed a blues solo by him, his tenor sax solo, and it was just like amazing amount of great ideas in there. You know that, that I can use. So besides that, I opened the lick book, and I've got tons and tons of you know lick book idea number fifty three. You know, and it'll just be here's a cool line you can do in B seven. You know that starts on the low strings and ends up on the high strings, and it's generally. You know, I wrote a book a while back called Improvising Without Scales, which means instead of uh, going up and down scales like we do, <clears throat> take those notes and, and put them together in intervals and use your ear to go, OK, I'm going to start with an E and then the next note is going to be C, which is a minor sixth up. Right. Then the next note is going to be down a half step to B. And then the next note is going to be an E, which is a fourth up. You know, and so now you've got boo damn and you're, and then the next note might be a high B, a fifth up from there, and and you end on the ninth. You know, so this is a way to uh, to improvise, which is non scalar You're actually putting together lines. The idea is if you put an A minor seventh in front of Eddie Van Halen or you or me or Pat Martino or Joe Pass, 
we're all going to play the same notes. It's either going to be the A minor pentatonic scale, the, har uh, the uh, Dorian mode, the Aeolian mode, like um, natural minor, or if you're Ingve or something, the, the harmonic minor, right? But it's basically we're going to play the same four or five scales. So it's how you put them together and how you phrase those notes that makes you sound different. And so that's basically the idea. That's like what your Joe Diorio was trying to teach you, sort of, is what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah that's you know, his, really cool. His advice, which was pretty brilliant, he goes, all through your life, your one goal is to make music sound different. And I, I thought about that for a while, and I said, what do you mean? And he says, well, listen to anybody you like. Say Herbie Hancock. That guy puts his hands on the piano and plays a chord, and you know it's him, and it's different. It's different than Keith Jarrett or Chick Corea or, or uh, you know, any of the other keyboard players. When you listen to uh, Miles Davis, you know, he makes music sound different. And that's beautiful advice. Yeah, that's and the way really you good. do that is that you, your, your lines have to be you know, put together in a way that they don't just go up and down scales or do exactly what Eddie Van Halen does. That is you know? such, I've got to work on that, man. That is such good <laughs> advice. No, that was, I learned a lot. Thank you. So, okay. So then you have the licks and you have what I learned from. And uh, so I, there's some really good stuff there. It's not, what I liked about it is it's not the normal, you know, here's a scale. He, it's, it's, it's practical. You know, and I thought that was really cool. And it's interesting, most important. You know, one of the things that I like when I, and maybe it's because I'm, I didn't start playing guitar until I'm older is I play what I enjoy because that's, and that's what you said you've done your whole lifetime is, and it makes, it makes it looking forward to pick up the guitar instead of, oh shit, I got to do my scales again, you know? So, um, I think that's great. And you can check that out at Carl Verheyen. It's again, Carl, C A R L V E R H E Y E N dot com. Man, I can't thank you enough for everything. Is there anything I, I missed or any final words of wisdom? Uh, let's see. You didn't miss anything. All right, good. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun, Craig. I really appreciate it. Um, I would say final words of wisdom. I would say, uh, to the up and coming guitar player, learn everything you dig. You know, don't limit yourself to to I'm going to be a heavy metal guitar player or I'm going to be a country guitar player. Because if you do, you get one little piece of the pie. And the music business is a big pie. Oh, yeah. And if you can play some rockabilly and some blues and some jazz and some, you know, I mean, this Essential Blues album, I discovered that I like country blues, Delta blues, Piedmont blues, Texas blues, Chicago blues, jazz blues, British blues. And I thought... Why limit myself to, you know, what I call shuffles and shades music? You know? Sure. Put on some glasses and play a shuffle. Why limit yourself to that? There's all, all kinds of wonderful uh, sub-genres out there, you know. And I like to play I like to play classical guitar and I like to play heavy metal and, you know, shred music and rock and roll and jazz. I'm a big jazz fan, you know. So I think that if you can if you can cross pollinate your music with bluegrass you know learn some tony rice licks and put them in there with some uh john schofield licks you know you will come up with something completely new and wonderful awesome so thanks that's my Carl. advice thank you very much man i appreciate it hang on one sec we'll wrap up everybody yeah. thank you so much for listening if you enjoyed this interview please share it with a friend on your social media channels we certainly appreciate your support sure. thanks so much to carver Hyen for spending time with us i really appreciate it and make sure you go to the home page of everyone loves guitar.com sign up to get on our newsletter list and most important remember that happiness is a choice so choose wisely be nice go play your guitar and have fun till next time peace and love everybody i'm out we hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. Thank you.